Hey everyone, and welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast dedicated to works by Asian and Asian American authors. It's our mid month episode, so we're going to be bringing you the latest news in Asian American literature. Uh, my name is Mara Renyua, and joining me is my co host, Rira Yu. Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. Um, my God, there are so many books. There's this a month. lot of news <laughs> this month. January was dead, and now February is just like all the Asian authors. And I'm like, yay, but <laughs> it took a while to compile this list. We got a jam-packed episode for you. Yeah, you're up till late. You're, t- you're tweeting at like 1 a.m. It was 1 a.m., and I was yeah. like, I want to sleep, but there's so many Asian authors <laughs> who released their books this month, and I'm happy, but I'm so tired. We also talk with Gori Monglik of Kitab World, a bookstore focusing on stories by and about and for South Asians. But before we get to that, let's uh, let's just jump right in. All right. These are new releases. Marvin, do you want to start? Starting with The Refugees by Viet Thanh Nguyen, um, publisher Grove Press, um, releasing February 7th. Oh, it released last week, February 7th, 2017. This is the Pulitzer Prize winning author that also wrote The Sympathizer, right? Yeah. This is his follow-up. Wasn't that just last year? Uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize in uh, last year, but it was published in 2015. Oh, okay. I was like, man, this guy is just writing awesome stories all the time. Well, yeah. <clears throat> um, the Refugees is a collection of short stories and explores the unresolved issues of memory and identity for the Vietnamese whose lives were disrupted by the quote-unquote American War. So it's an anthology. And um, yeah, like um, I've heard great things about it like the author has been in so many reviews like (laughs) the new yorker he's been doing uh interviews left and right uh he recently talked uh in in orange county i think it was like a couple of days ago so he's like on his whole book tour hurrah yeah no that's just awesome that this um like these stories are now coming out and it's so relevant because of the refugee crisis with syria yeah. And, you know, the Vietnamese community has been, you know, traditionally very conservative. But when it comes to the Syrian refugees, they've been very supportive of, you know, bringing them in because of their own personal experiences. So it's it's really, 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 really awesome that we're getting more literature um, with these point of views. Um, next on our list is Winter Song by S.J. Jones. It also released on February 7th, 2017. And the book is set in 19th century Bavaria and tells the tale of a 19-year-old, Liesel, an innkeeper's daughter who dreams of being a famous composer. When the Goblin King abducts her sister, Liesel journeys to the underground and rescues her by agreeing, by agreeing to marry the king in her stead. As she falls in love and finds her voice, Liesel's talent blossoms, but the underground soon begins to gradually drain her life force. And that is published by Thomas Dune. And... I saw the cover and it looks beautiful <laughs> and it reminds me of Labyrinth and I'm I was pretty sure say, I'm Goblin pretty King, sure isn't that the David Bowie character? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's inspired by it because I've seen the author's uh, Twitter and she had like this Funko figurine of uh, David Bowie from Labyrinth. Yeah, cause wasn't so he like, also the Goblin King? Yeah, he was yeah. a Goblin King. So I'm just like, oh, like this is definitely this is inspired sequel, by Labyrinth. <laughs> the unofficial sequel to Labyrinth, Winter Song. Awesome. Um, next up is when he sprang from his bed, staggered backward, and fell dead. We clung together with faint hearts and mutely questioned each other by Christopher King. That's a really long title. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Published by Green Mountains Review Books. Uh, this released last week, February 5th, 2017. Um, this list isn't chronological, but it's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> A winner of the GMR Book Prize, Kang's first book is a collection of 880 tiny stories that form a kind of sly, wondrous narrative whole. So another anthology or? Um, yeah, it, it kind of is an anthology, but uh, the short stories are tiny. Mm-hmm. Like it's only like two or three sentences. And oh. the book is also very short. It's around 140 pages. So 140 pages, 880 pages stories do the math it's a lot of stories a lot of stories i'm actually super curious might check that out i mean i read some of his uh tiny stories and they're pretty great so (laughs) good book and it's an indie book so support your independent publishers uh next on our list is pachinko by minjin lee uh the author of free food for millionaires uh this book also released on february 7th 
and Pachinko follows one Korean family through the generations, beginning in early 1900s Korea with Sunja, the prized daughter of a poor yet proud family whose unplanned pregnancy threatens to shame them all. Deserted by her lover, Sunja is saved when a young tubercular minister offers to marry and bring her to Japan. And that is published by Grand Central Publishing. So it's not about the gambling parlors in Asia. No, I, I thought so too. I actually got Pachinko through a book of the month. Uh, mm-hmm. So I have it with me and I'm really excited to read it. Um, but yeah, it's about Korean immigrants in Japan d- when Japan uh, was occupying Korea at the time. Wow. And uh, the book kind of like shows a different side to the whole Korean Japan relationship because Korean immigrants were treated like crap by Japanese during that time <laughs> during that time period. So um, I'm personally interested in yeah. reading it because like I know my grandfather, he went to uh, Japan to like pursue an education like during like a lot of countries the sent war. their yeah. scholars to Japan. So yeah. like so it's like kind of like I'm peeking into uh, like my family's history in a way. Yeah. Because no one talks about it. So I have to find <laughs> out through like book. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's great to have like historical literature from our own, our own heritage cultures, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know like for a book of the month, uh, the judge that recommended Pachinko was Alexander Chi, who was the oh. author of uh, oh, follow Queen our, of the Night. One of our followers on, on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. You, sh- you guys should follow him. He's great. Thanks for the follow. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he listens. <laughs> um, next up is Black Taj by Mohini Kent by Hope World Publishing. This one releases, oh, next week, February 21st, 2017. Uh, set in 1993, the book follows Simi, a well-born young woman who has so far lived with privilege and certainty. But when the Babri Mosque, mosque crumbles, I totally cr- uh, butchered that. Uh, so does the careful structure of her life. To the horror of her grandmother and the outrage of her friends, in the riot-torn city of Atmapuri, she falls deeply in love with a Muslim doctor, Imran. The partition of India stands like a giant ghost in between the star-crossed lovers. So this is, again, like a historical fiction of a time of conflict, right? Yeah, yeah, a t- time of conflict. Um, this is also an independent publisher, so... Yeah. Yeah, uh, next, we have Sonata in K by Karen Anhui Lee, published by Ellipsis uh, Press, and it's coming out in February 13th. Uh, the description from the publisher uh, is, who is Kafka-san? Is he a digitally remastered hologram for the famous writer? Or a golem engineered from a finger bone illegally ex- excavated from a grave in Prague? Or just your garden variety flesh and blood clone? No one is quite sure, least of all Kay, a Nisei woman hired to be Kafka-san's interpreter and and chauffeur through millennial Los Angeles. So science fiction. Maybe. I'm not sure. Like, I I haven't really heard much about this book, so I'm I'm (laughs) actually not quite sure um, what exact genre it is. But it sounds interesting. Yeah. So I might have to check that out. Uh, Next up is Empress of a Thousand Skies by... by Rhoda Beleza. Beleza. By Rhoda Beleza. Um, published by Razorbill. Um, this one came out last week, February 7th, 2017. Uh, after her family perished in a suspicious space in a ooh, in a suspicious spacecraft accident, Crown Princess Ri grew up in exile while a corrupt government ruled in her stead. Now Ri has come of age and is ready to avenge her family, but on the eve of her coronation, she's attacked by an assassin and only narrowly escapes with her life. Ri teams up with her accused killer, a pilot named El Alsha, and together they fight to reclaim her throne and save the galaxy from a deadly plot. That sounds YA, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is <laughs> YA. And wow, February 7th was like a big day for Asian writers because they're like, let's all publish our books on that same day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, we have Tell Me Everything You Don't Remember, The Stroke That Changed My Life by Christine hyung Ok Lee. Um, and the story goes, Christine hyung Ok Lee woke up on New Year's Eve 2006 and saw the world, quite literally, upside down. She had a stroke at age 33. Her memoir, Tell Me Everything You Don't Remember, const- uh, is constructed from fragments of memories jotted down in notebooks and chronicle- chronicles her journey of reinvention. And it's published by Echo Press, and it came out uh, on Valentine's Day. Oh. 
Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. Yeah. This past week, yeah. I, yeah. Happy Valentine's Week. Yeah, Valentine's Week. <laughs> Is that a thing? I don't know. Um, that sounds super interesting. Uh, sorry. I, I think that's just like so scary getting a stroke at such a young age. Yeah. Okay, next up is Desi Girls, um, edited by Divya Mathur, um, published by Hope World Publishing. This one comes out next week, February 21st, 2017, and it's an anthology of short stories by 22 women writers, all born in India, but now living abroad in Canada, Denmark, Norway, the Arab Emirates, the UK, and America. These stories feature men... These stories feature mainly female characters who have to choose whether to cling to their Indian culture, discard it completely, or learn how to adjust and compromise. So, like, diaspora of the story, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And I think the final book on our new releases for this month is The Ship Beyond Time by Heidi Heilig. And uh, this is the sequel to The Girl from Everywhere. And the story follows the time-traveling sailor Nyx, who takes her crew to a mythical utopia to find a way to manipulate time after hearing a devastating prediction. Nyx must grapple with decisions that will change the course of history and risk her own existence and the existences of her loved ones. And that's published by Green Willow Books. Ooh, time travel. Yeah, uh, The Girl from Everywhere. Um, I bought that book and I still haven't read it. So, <laughs> And now the sequel is out. So I'm like, oh God, I need to read both of them. You know what's a way to read? Make sure we read that is to assign that next time. Oh, it's on our list. <laughs> like it, It's on our Goodreads listopia. It's just buried. By the way, we didn't mention this in the top of the show, but um, this month's book is Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Cho. Uh, hopefully, you guys, hopefully you guys have all been reading that. I've been having a hard time tracking it down at bookstore. So um, I have a lead on it this weekend. If I don't find it by Saturday, I'm just going to buy it on Amazon. Yeah. But. Good idea. Because the, <laughs> the book is like 370 pages. So I can do that in like two nights. That's fine. Don't say I didn't warn you. But okay. <laughs> Moving on to book deals and news. We're going to talk about book deals and news. Yeah. Um <laughs> This is breaking news, actually. This came out yesterday as of... So we're recording on Thursday. Um, this came out Wednesday, which is Constance Wu was in talks to star in the film adaptation of Kevin Kwan's Crazy Rich Asians, uh, which is, of course, one of the biggest productions in right now in Asian America. That's, you know, I, I guess Warner Brothers picked up, picked up the rights last year, mm-hmm. and they've been doing an open casting call the last couple months. Yeah. So if you go on YouTube, you can see a lot of people... Um, who submitted scenes and trying to get casted, but I guess Constance Wu is in talks for one of the leads. Yeah. Uh, so that can only mean two characters. Yeah, right? Rachel or Astrid. And I am banking on Rachel. I haven't read the book, but hearing from what I hear about the characters, I would say, yeah, a Rachel, like, I would love to see her as a Rachel. Especially she would, her, she would like, be yeah. so good as Rachel. Like <laughs> I like I wasn't actually very excited to see Crazy Rich Asians because I was like I don't know, like, I didn't really, like, I wasn't in love with the book, but I really want to see, like, a cast of, like, s- like, of A-list, uh, like, Asian actors. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know, but now now that, like, Constance Wu is in negotiations, I'm like, maybe. That's awesome. Yeah. Constance Wu, of course, also plays Jessica Huang on the hit show Fresh Off the Boat and is pretty much our Asian American it girl at the moment. Um, everyone loves her and she gives great hot takes. Yes. She's amazing our fierce takes. little unicorn. Follow her Twitter and it is amazing. Um I haven't read the book yet, but I know we're going to probably eventually sign it for the book club, right? Yeah, we'll probably read it when we get closer to the release date of the film. Mhm. Cuz that's when the publishers release cheaper paperbacks and it will be more (laughs) economical. (laughs) Oh, then I can get a copy of Crazy Rich Asians with Constance Wu's face in it. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, Actually, I might... I, I own I own the ebook for Crazy Rich Asians, but I might buy the paperback. When is the third book coming out? Because I know that the third... The the last book of the trilogy is coming out. No, I only read the first book. (laughs) Um, What else is going on? Okay, next. Uh... Putnam acquired legend author Marie, Marie Lu's YA historical fantasy novel, Kingdom of Back. The novel is based on the childhood of Mozart and his sister Nanner. Uh, the logline goes, 
When a magical imp in the form of a gorgeous teen boy from the imaginary kingdom of Bak offers to fulfill her secret wish to always be remembered, Nanero unwittingly makes a terrible pact to, solidif- to solidify her place in history. And Kingdom of Bak is slated to be published in early 2019. So is this like a alternate history or a... Historical a... fantasy. So the okay. same genre as a Sorcerer to the Crown. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Marie Lu, obviously the author of the Leg- Legend series, the, the Young Elite yeah. series. And uh, I think she has a... Another book that's uh, based on Warcraft that's coming out awesome. early, like sometime early spring. So that's something to, like she's busy. Wow. Congrats to Marie Lou for, uh, <laughs> for the, the new deal. <clears throat> Let's see what else. Uh, <laughs> Rira has this big list of news that we're supposed to read. Okay, here we go. Here's our next story. Uh, Amazon Crossing took worldwide English rights to When the Future Comes Too Soon, the sequel to Malaysian Chinese author Selena Sak Chin Yoke's novel, The Woman Who Breathed Two Worlds. Uh, The book is set during the Japanese occupation of Malaysia in the early 1940s and is slated for a summer 2017 release. Uh, So congrats to Selena uh, on the book deal. Yeah. Uh, next, we have um, Christy Octaviano Books bought world rights to two middle grade novels by Pushcart Prize winning poet and author Mariko Nagai. Uh, the first book, uh, titled Under the Broken Sky, is a novel in verse about a Japanese orphan's experience in occupied Manchuria during World War II, and it's scheduled for uh, a 2019 release. The second volume is scheduled for 2020. Lots of historical fiction about the uh, Jeez, Japanese Jeez, I wonder occupation. why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's interesting because those that would be like our grandparents' stories, you know. Yeah. Also, I think like I think the publishers know now. They're like, oh, we need to prepare for the next like four years. <laughs> <laughs> Jean Luan Yang, a cartoonist and national ambassador of young people's literature, announced the launch date of Reading Without Walls, a program designed to celebrate reading and diversity and encourage young readers to read books outside of their personal experience. Uh, the program is slated to begin in April, but the website is up and running now. What's the website? Readingwithoutwalls.com. Uh, and, that, and that website is readingwithoutwalls.com. And this is something that's super, super important these days. You know, we, we talk a lot about how, how you know, the, the side of, I guess, um, there's there's two warring sides of, like, U.S. right now. There's two warring sides in, like, American culture right now. One side wants to keep everything as it is, and the other side wants, like, envisions a multicultural world. And, you know, uh, to form that multicultural world, you need to have a multicultural a point of view. Yeah. So it's really great that um, Jean Luen Yang, who's been um, on the forefront of this movement for a long time, like kind of put it into action. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's the national ambassador of young people's literature. <laughs> it's quite a title to have. Great yeah. titles come with great responsibilities. I, know. I mean, we're, we're doing our part with this podcast, too. Hopefully some of you guys <laughs> who are following along, you know, like this isn't just for Asians. We're just pushing... You know, the, the Asian point of view yeah. out there. Uh, next in our news is Sourcebooks has acquired worldwide English rights to Chasing Red, an adult novel by Canadian author Isabel Ronan, which was the most read story on, WAP, on Wattpad in 2016. The story had over 126 million reads on Wattpad, um, and Chasing Red tells the story of Veronica Red Strafford, a cynical straight-A college student who is offered a place to stay by a notorious basketball player after she gets kicked out of her apartment. The story will be published in two volumes, the first being released in September and the second volume in November. What's Wattpad? Okay, so Wattpad is kind of like fanfiction.net, Okay. But uh, not only is there fan fiction, but like, uh, like there's a lot of like original work there. So okay. there's a lot of uh, a lot of different genres, um, including like nonfiction, uh, romance, sci-fi, whatnot. A lot of amateur writers or aspiring writers they post their stories there to get feedback, and a lot of those really popular uh, 
stories get picked up by publishers, uh, probably smaller publishers, but they still get picked up. Nice. Yeah, so... I spent many hours of my youth on Wattpad. <laughs> oh, it's that old? I have no idea that it existed. I mean, like, I think it came into fruition, like, when, like, like what, when I was in college. So it's been okay. around for so a number of years. when I was an adult, got it. But that's interesting <laughs> because, um, like, I don't really hear that many news about, uh, about, like, Asian authors on Wattpad. So. Nice. It's interesting. Um, and our last story of the month is oscar noms came out and uh we got three that are relevant to this podcast at least um arrival based on the short story story of your life by ted chang got uh, got nominated for best picture best picture and best adapted screenplay and a whole bunch of other things um so did lion based on a memoir a long way home by saru Birley, which is the um the google map story about how uh how an Indian adoptee in Australia was able to find his way back to the village that he was from by using Google Maps, starring uh, Dev Patel. Yeah. Uh, who's also nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Why Best Supporting Actor? Isn't, like, isn't he the main character? He is. Okay. Um, <laughs> and the third movie on that list is Silence, which is based on a 1966 Japanese historical novel by... Uh, Shusaku Endo, who is best known as the Japanese Roman Catholic author. Right. And this um, is the Scorsese film, right? Yeah, this is a Scorsese film. It did not do well in the box office because there wasn't a lot of promotion on mm. it. But uh like critically, like i I think it got some good reviews. Yeah, I'm sure it was well made. Um I just I got I got like shades of religious last samurai in it because um, it's about it's about a white missionary right that's the main character um i not really missionary so um it's set during i don't know i don't know what period it is but um yeah like uh like i think like a Port- portuguese priest is sent to japan mm-hmm. to investigate uh uh, investigate another priest and when he arrives in japan he realizes that a lot of uh, christians a lot of catholics have gone underground because uh like a lot of the there's like a japanese police that is hunting down japanese mm. catholics and um and they're luring them out by like making people stomp on like crucifixes and um and the people who don't trample on those crosses they get taken away and they are tortured until they renounce their faith and uh i think like the second character like the priest that was supposed to be investigated like he's being held captive and um yeah and like at first when i saw like the movie poster i was just like wow like white savior but (laughs) i actually read the uh like the summary of the actual novel and it's pretty faithful yeah okay so it's interesting. Yeah. Those are just some of the Oscar noms, the, the ones that we're, we're most uh, paying attention to. We're getting there. I mean, Ang Lee's the only, yeah. like, Asian. It's good to have more than one person to root for <laughs> during, the entire, <laughs> <laughs> during the entire show. I mean, I'm, I mean, those authors are not going to be at the Oscars. But yeah. In the back of my head, so I'm like, oh, an yeah. Asian person wrote that. I think we, you have to call that out. You have to, like, say it so people can, oh, I didn't know that. So Asians can do stuff, hmm. you know. <laughs> we have to claim our stuff, you guys. Yeah, and that is our news and our new releases um, coming up. We're going to talk to Gori Mon- Gori Monglik of Kitab World, a bookstore um, featuring stories um, by for and about South Asians. Um, <clears throat> um, but before we get to that, just a reminder that the February book pick for Books and Boba is. Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Sho. Um, if you haven't started on it, like me, you should get on that. Also, uh, Books and Boba is going to be doing a live Google Hangout discussion of the book on March 4th, uh, 1130 uh, Pacific Time. And uh, people in LA were meeting in person the very next day. So, <laughs> so yeah, if you're not in LA you want to join in... Um, Google Hangouts is, I think there's a 10-person limit to the chat room. So yes, but I think you can still uh, like, listen in, right? Listen in. Yeah, so um, make sure to check it out. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat if, if there's overflow. 
but it'd be great to hear from you all and then your thoughts about this book. Um, I'm excited. Apparently there's a character named Edgeworth. Oh, yeah. You saw my tweet. I saw it. <laughs> it's um, great. I'm almost <laughs> done. I have like 100 pages left and I really, really like it. Awesome. I'm looking forward to get getting started on it. Um, so, yeah, um, keep it, keep tabs on that. We'll be making reminders on our Twitter and our Facebook groups. Uh, so give us a follow. Keep an eye on that. Um, and on that note, let's get to our um, interview with Glory. And we're here now with our guest. Our first guest. Our first guest ever for um, an interview section for Books and Boba. Um, like we mentioned, we want to bring you the latest in book news from the literary world when it comes to Asian Americans. But we also want to talk to some cool people working in the space. So I want to introduce our first guest, Gori Monglik. Uh, she is the co-founder of Kitab World, a bookstore. Um, Gori, why don't you introduce uh, Kitab World to us? Sure. Um, thanks. First of all, thanks, Marvin and Rita, for having me um, on the podcast. I'm excited to be the first interviewer um, or interviewee, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, Kitab World is really a niche online children's bookstore, and we launched just last year, some, right around the time you guys launched this podcast, actually. Um, it was and, uh, you know, our focus and our sort of reason for launching this was we wanted to make it easy for, um, it was twofold. It was one, it was, we wanted to make it easy for South Asian parents to discover and get access to South Asian, you know, children's literature, like obviously books, but also other tools, you know, including toys and games to teach their kids about South Asian culture. You know, as immigrants here, that's always a challenge. And, you know, um, that parents often face that they, the, how do they make sure that their kids are, you know, are equally well versed in their dual cultural identity. And, and we felt, uh, there was a very robust children's market in India and there were many books being published in India. Unfortunately, those books are not distributed in the U.S. through like traditional distributors, and many of them are not even available on Amazon or other, you know, even or physical bookstores or libraries. So we said, you know, how do we make this easy for parents? And we said the solution here was having an online niche bookstore where we put together everything in one place. So when parents come and, they, you know, they're looking for something around, let's say, like South Asian food, like samosas or dosas, or they're looking for festivals or visionaries, they can find books around that to, to um, you know, expose their children to those books and help them learn more about the culture. That was one, but one sort of angle to this. And the other angle was the window part where we wanted these books also to be available to you know, anybody who was interested in South Asian culture, maybe, you know, and who, or who wanted to learn about that and have access to these books to really um, get a better understanding of South Asian culture. So that's awesome. Yeah, I was, I've always been amazed that, you know, now with technology being as it is, with the tools being uh, more easily available and um, robust, that, you know, you can start a business with a more narrow focus on, you know, on niches and on um, your personal likes and passions, and you'll be able to find a um, an audience that you know will yeah. be sustained, and it makes it possible for things like because if you're running like a general bookstore, like you probably couldn't get away with just carrying. We're, we're exactly. also yeah, we're yeah. also seeing a lot of um, a lot of apps like We Need Diverse Books and like uh, and programs that are encouraging younger readers to uh, read diversely. Um, I like I, I I know that like there's still still problems in schools where like their curriculum, uh, it's like all white male authors mm -hmm. on their reading list. So it's like great that like you have this um you have this business that's like promoting, uh, works by South Asian and also Muslim authors. Um, but um, I I did want to ask you um how do you come to like what la nah, 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 let me start that over. How do you uh, curate the titles for Kitab World? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, it, 
it's been it's sort of been interesting uh, evolution of how we curate so obviously when we started off you know we we spent months literally um you know researching looking for books on uh, you know we we decided to split it up um by country so first that that was because we were targeting the whole of south asia so we wanted to find books that were related to afghanistan pakistan you know sri lanka india nepal bangladesh so we started out like you know finding what was available in the us and then also trying to contact publishers and and see what you know what what's out there right and so the first challenge we faced was some of the books that were available in the us were had a very western perspective like oh this poor girl in afghanistan and you know she's dying and you know she needs to be saved and we're like you know no i mean maybe but not always you know so it was really about trying to um trying to have positive representations trying to show different stories and so we really had to dig deep and for you know we were thrilled for example when we found these folk tales from afghanistan which are just like fun stories you know just with different illustrations and they're as fun as a red riding hood or a goldy locks but it's just that you know they haven't made their way uh, into popular culture the same way as those stories have you know so we so we were thrilled so th- you know that was one of our focuses the other sort of interesting dilemma we've had is uh, because there's been a significant lack of traditionally published books especially a lack in you know us publishers and a lack of picture books we got, got approached and we initially like were approached by many self published authors and so and we still continue to get approached by many of these self published authors so so there it's it's a bit of a you know we have to review those books and we have to see whether you know whether they are like adequate and whether they would be good for the market to do list them on our site so there's obviously like you know some so th- those factors and the way we evaluate the books is obviously you know the quality of the content the authenticity the value you know the quality of the illustrations um the message the book is you know putting forth so and the the appropriability like some books are better suited for homes some books are better suited for classrooms so sort of looking at it from that perspective as well yeah that's always the um the double edged part of technology which is making it easier means more people are doing stuff which means yeah. you know um <laughs> you get a lot more <laughs> you know degrees of quality yeah i mean like as we've been doing this podcast like we've like we've discovered that asian american literature and asian literature it's it's a really really big genre and even within yeah. like subgenres there's like so much diversity within the writers cuz everybody is bringing their own experiences and even if like you have like two picture books by like indian uh children's writers they might bring something different in their message so it's it's always like astounding just to see like how much content there really is and it and also it's kind of it's kind of sad because like a lot of those authors don't get the exposure that um that some other authors might get through mainstream publishing Exactly. And that's like, you know, that sort of speaks to that whole own voices movement that that's um been going on, you know, and there's discussion and we see the benefits of that, but you know, like I wish that you know there were also there was some sort of a, you know, yeah, like a more rev- detailed review process or something like that because it's hard to tell an author that your book is not nice, you know, but <laughs> at the same time we feel like we have like an obligation to our customers. So it's it's a really um uh, a catch 22 at times, you know. Um you brought up own vo- voices. Um so I just want to ask you uh what are your th- uh just overall thoughts on um muslim and south asian representation in literature yeah i mean my it's sad i mean you know i think the situation today you know it's it's unfortunate that there's not enough representation in the publishing industry and and hence sort of the lack of as many books you know that 
as they should be reflect if you had to consider what the population of the US looks like today, you know, and and that's what we were really trying to change through one of our like our countering Islamophobia through stories campaign. So the idea was that even the books that so there's a couple of different arguments that come up, right? First is you know, divorce books are put under one one separate category and then the mainstream books are under one category. And we're like, no, you know, why should there be like this classification? You know, these books belong in classrooms as much as the other books do. And then the other argument that sometimes we got was, oh, these books, you know, if they're like, if they're for Muslim children, they don't sell as much. So that's why publishers don't, you know, don't work, don't prioritize these books as much as other books. And so... You know, when we started digging deeper, we realized that there are some good books out there which haven't really, they don't get their moments in the sun or, you know, they're very short lived. So that's when we curated these book lists as part of our countering Islamophobia through stories campaign. I mean, you brought up the um, campaign counter uh, Islamophobia through stories. Um, can we um, get a little more into that? Like, when did that begin? And, um, I guess, like, what were the main goals for the campaign? Sure, yeah. So um, the seeds of the campaign, like, in our head, you know, were started right around when when President Trump got elected. And and we, we were brainstorming and we said, you know, what can we do as a small children's bookstore like where where is the gap like what what can how can we help and you know we realized when we looked around we felt frustrated there are that children were not exposed to any kind of muslim representations in you know in the books around them at, at all like and that was not part of the curriculum it's not you know it, and you know there's adequate research to show that Kids, especially young kids between three and eight and nine, are very receptive and open to learning about new things. Um, but if they're not exposed to that, you know, then that that window of you know, like being open, sort of starts to close down. And then they are by ten plus, they're more, you know, they're kind of more likely to go with things that they already know or they're comfortable with. So we we said, you know, what we really need to do is we want to provide a framework for parents and teachers to um, to start these discussions early. And it doesn't have to be it wasn't you know, it's it's not even like a um, like any concrete sort of discussion. It's about just giving them some books that they could introduce in their children's libraries, which shows them a Muslim kid or a Muslim family or, you know, a different way of culture, like a different cultural um, illustration or different clothing so that that's something that they've seen in their lives and it doesn't come across as something which is unfamiliar um, or, you know, weird, right, in some ways. Like for kids, you know, anything they've not seen or is like, oh, that's weird. So how do we change that? And so what we did was we, um, and it's such a complex topic, so we said, you know, we wanted to break it down. So what we did is we created four curated book lists on um, on four topics. The first was Muslim Kids as Heroes, where we just picked amazing, you know, books in each genre, like picture books, middle grade, you know, chapter books, and YA and middle grade, but just simple fun books which ha- happen to have uh, Muslim kids as protagonists and uh, so like one of our best sellers in that for example is this book called Big Red Lollipop and it's about these oh my god I love that book <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's like three girl, you know three sisters like mom you know being raised in in the U.S. and it's just a it has these cultural undertones of a Muslim family or you know whatever so it was it's it's about getting these books out there and mainstream you know rather than having them hidden under one separate bookshelf you know that was the idea um so that was the first list the second list was inspiring Muslim leaders and thinkers and the idea there was we wanted to provide um you know sort of a revival of of um you know, make people remember the contributions that have come from famous Muslims or, you know, from the Muslim civilization. So there, one of our like star book was 
this book called 1001 Inventions from the Muslim Civilization. Uh, and, you know, it's amazing. Like, I learned so much stuff out of that book that I also, I don't think I knew or, I mean, I was ever taught that, you know, but there's so many connections and so much of, you know, what is attributed to inventions by the West had origins in the Muslim, um, you know, in various parts of the world, you know, the Islamic world. Yeah. And so we wanted to reflect that. And then we also featured, you know, famous Muslims, whether it's Muhammad Ali or Muhammad Yunus or, you know, even historical in terms of um, there were people like Ibn Sina and Ibn Battuta who back in the day had made important contributions. The third list was celebrating Islam, where we just wanted to provide, you know, a framework. And especially this becomes relevant in middle school because that's when they learn Islam as a religion, was provide a framework for teachers to, uh, you know, to share stories about um, you know, how Eid and Ramadan are celebrated, what are the key tenets of Islam, how actually those tenets are very similar to other religions um, like Judaism or Christianity. You know, so there's a common sort of core in all religions. We wanted to provide that framework. And the final list was folk tales from Islamic traditions and where it was sort of similar to what I touched upon earlier. We wanted to provide different fun stories around, you know, that kids can relate to or learn from because you know that's the purpose of folk tales and then we sort of concluded with a, a, a consolidated list and we split that age wise and we just launched that on valentine's day and and the idea was you know let's let's come together and and you know fight the hate around us as and you know with with different with showing our kids different perspectives and and opening their minds yeah today <laughs> that's awesome especially with the folk tales and just all these stories i'm just recalling like the stories that I, we learned in school when i was you know growing up and it was a lot of like greek mythology and king arthur and i was thinking hmm what school did you go to <laughs> <What>? <laughs> i don't remember them teaching like greek mythology in like elementary school but um well middle school yeah, oh, yeah like middle school and i was thinking yeah it's all greek mythology <laughs> it is shakespeare you know yeah. it's it, like where's tagore for example or where's you know where's like some elements of buddhism yeah. or you know whatever like it's just it's not there Aesop's fables um, and like you know there's you know, there's Chinese fables, yeah. there's Indian fables. Um, the Chinese version of King Arthur, which is like the Three Kingdoms, it's like just as interesting. Or even, you know, like other cultures' mythologies. Like I mean, we have like Arthur. centuries and centuries <laughs> worth of stories just like from the continent of Asia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, what I really love about um, like all of the lists that um, count in Islamophobia through uh, stories is that it's not just children's books. It's also like YA and uh, new adult and adult books and nonfiction. Because I think it's just as important for adults to read diverse books. <laughs> I mean, it's great to start <laughs> early. I mean, for sure, if you're a kid, like it's it's great to see like other um, diverse experiences um, through books. But for adults, you know, like as we get older, we tend to put on blinders and we just tend to stick with what is familiar. And um, my next question is, have you seen kind of a shift in the attitude towards um, like Muslim and South Asian characters in literature or, or um, South Asian authors in, in publishing, um, especially with what's been happening with the election uh, last year and uh, <laughs> the month of Trump. <laughs> in the month of Trump, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they definitely have been. So, firstly, like our campaign itself, like it was, uh, you know, we're so grateful to the community. People really reached out. People supported our campaign, and people, you know, bought books from us. And uh, you know, many teachers and schools actually bought books from us. And um, and not just that, but I also I don't know. Um, I think we shared that on our Facebook page where there's a, a whole bunch of literary agents who said that they would accept and they're looking for Muslim authors, uh, you know, to write like anybody who has a manuscript about for any pretty much any genre of children's books. So there's definitely and I like last year, Simon and Schuster. So this happened before the election, but. <laughs> 
it's still sort of timely. Simon and Schuster started an imprint called Salam, Salam Reads, Reads, which is a uh, you know the first ever sort of children's book imprint, which is focused on books featuring Muslim kids. And their first book is actually going to come out next month. Mm. And so there's been a there's a general support from the community on trying to increase the books and and make these books more you know having access and we're really I think we're really thankful for that actually. Awesome, yeah, it's really great to see that in the face of you know this nationalist anti-immigrant movement that so many people, especially in the states, have kind of risen up and you know taken a stand that the future of the U.S. is a multicultural society and that we want to build towards that so um and part of that is you know having more diverse media to spread out there um it's really great that you know kitab world is a part of that you know injecting these stories into into um the world uh i guess my last question for you is as you know as the proprietors of a a bookstore uh, who are you who are you guys most excited about like what's Anything upcoming or anything you're excited about in the world of books? Yeah. Oh, up, upcoming um, authors. Somebody who, who. Yeah. Was that? Yeah. Um, oh, we have so many, so it's sort of hard to. But if I had to pick one that we're really excited, so we just recently did a post actually, which is a roundup of upcoming South Asian literature in two thousand, like that's being released in two thousand seventeen, and um, it was really fun doing the post because it was like you know you're researching what new books are coming out and what they're about and and all of that, and um, and one of the books that caught my eye just because of its cover is a book called Pashmina, and it's written by this local California, actually she lives in San Francisco, author, first time author called Nidhi Chanani, but she's, she's actually more of an illustrator. So this is a, this is actually a graphic novel and I'm really excited about it because first of all, the cover just looks so stunning. So I'm like, Oh, the book has to be really good. And she's, (laughs) you know, um, uh, and not to say that, yeah, you know, I know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but this one, I think we can make an exception. Um, and then, but also just because the book itself um, seems like a very interesting topic. It's about this high school girl and, you know, how, like growing up in Southern California and, and sort of discovering her family history. And Pashmina, just as a background, is is a type of wool with which shawls are made in South Asia. So it's like a, and a shawl is like a, I don't know, like a small, thin blanket thing, kind of thing, which people wear. Like they cut, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like. Yeah, over the, over the. Uh, over your, neck, yeah, right? you kind of wear yeah. it on your body to keep you warm. So it's, it's, it's like a piece of clothing, but, and um, Pashmina shawl, you know, it, Pashmina shawls are, are like a, like a very, they're very expensive. And they, you know, so I don't really know what the Pashmina relevance in the book is, but I'm really looking forward to what reading that book. And right now, Nidhi is actually in Disneyland doing illustrations and, um, and stuff. So I mean, her illustrations are just so stunning that I'm really excited about the book and seeing what ha- what she comes out with in next after that. Awesome. We'll have to look out for that. We we love graphic novels here at Book I, Assemble, I've but... actually heard of Pashmina and I saw the cover and I was like, I really want to read that. <laughs> like, when is, when is that going to come out? Because I need that in my hands right now. Awesome. <laughs> we'll look out for that. Um, thank you so much, Gauri. Um, the bookstore, again, is Kitab World. You can find that at K-I-T-A-A-B-W-O-R-L-D.com. And also check out their campaign, Counter Islamophobia Through Stories. Um, Are there any other uh, places where our audience can find you, Gori? Yeah, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So all with the same hashtag, like same ID, Kitab World. And, and that's how, you know, people can find us on social media. And then, of course, we just have our own website. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you for the opportunity. This yeah. is fun. This is a lot of fun, yeah. Um, and yeah, um, good luck to the rest of your campaign, and we look forward to uh, seeing what you guys come up with. Thank you. And that was uh, our interview with Gory Monglik of Kitab World. Um, that website, again, is www.kitabworld.com. Um, check it out. They have, a lot of great, um, they have a lot of great stuff on there. Um, and definitely check out their campaign, Countering Islamophobia Through Stories. And that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Uh, this has been the mid-month news episode uh, for February 2017. Um, Rira, anything, any last words? 
Mm. Don't forget the resource to crown. Yeah. Yeah, like actually read the book that we picked out. <laughs> and a reminder again that um, in addition to the LA meetup, there's also going to be a Google Hangout. Um, so if you want to join in and talk to us about the Sorcerer to the Crown, um, check out our Facebook and our Twitter for more information. Yeah, and we will see you. Yeah, we'll see you. So uh, our next episode is actually going to come out the first week of March just because it's a short month. But yeah. So just a quick heads up, and yeah, uh, we'll see you guys next time on Books and Boba. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. This episode of Books and Boba was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu, and produced and edited by Marvin Yue. For further discussion on the books covered at Books and Boba, please visit our Goodreads forum. You can find the link on our Facebook page at Books and Boba, as well as by searching for the group Books and Boba on Goodreads.com. Books and Boba is also a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a brand new collective of Asian American podcasts and podcasters. You can learn more about the collective as well as check out our founding slate of programs by visiting the website www.podcastpotluck.com. Love.